Every day it's getting, uh, the internet is connecting more and more, right? You know, you have these little robots in your kitchens now that tell you various things, um, Alexa, Siri, all of them, right? Everything is being connected, and the consequence, therefore, is that the entire system is more and more vulnerable. Just as it's connecting more, it becomes more vulnerable. Uh, and, and this is exactly what we should be concerned with. So, I, I have a short technical question. Um, how does this uh, spreading threat affect the way in which uh, planes are navigated these days? Because you set up in your uh, in your laptop or in actually uh, what is it? Um, uh, notebook, um, your course, and feed that into the machine and... Well, I, you know, I'll tell you, uh, I keep thinking, I keep thinking that I should do something about being on Gmail, for example. Uh, uh, the way I, I probably should try to make my own com uh, computer more secure. I, I'm sure that occasionally something is picked up and you, you know um, I, I'm I would worry if I was in the corporate world because I think that's where they really want to you have both cyber criminals and also states that might want to 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 uh, somehow affect corporate activity in another state the best example in my opinion although it wasn't it, they said it was not a cyber attack. It was simply a switch. As you may know, many people in, uh, in late June, right? No, early June it was, couldn't use their Visa cards in Europe, right? The Visa system went down. The Visa card system went down, right? So people were in supermarkets with trolleys full of food. Couldn't pay for it, right? How many transactions do you think were affected? Five million. Now, I'm sure it was just a switch. That's what Visa card said. You know, a faulty switch. I doubt it. I'm sure it was something else. And if you think about how, you know, these things where you swipe the card <laughs> and you don't even have to put in your code, what a good idea. I'm sorry. I don't think so. Um, I'm glad my bank only lets me spend 30 euros a time on that. <laughs> You know, but some people have a kind of unlimited spending with that. So. Others? Yes. Uh. Well, th thank you for these two wonderful presentations. I would like to go back to um, Dr. Bozek's um, um, lecture. I think you are completely right when you are criticizing our titles. Um, we should have rather suggest um, the title instead of human security in the age of conflict, which was used usually in the last couple of years, in a new age of uncertainty, which is, which was, or interregnum, which was identified by Elmer Honkish, defined, or, 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 or Zygmunt Bauman. Um, we, what we try to do here, the exercise um, during these Blue Sky conferences and our seminars and, and, um, and workshops, a, a, the, the new characteristica specifica of an age we probably don't understand properly, but which, which um, are, how to say, showing their contours more and more. And, um, well, our first lecture, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, not everyone heard everyone, but um, everyone, everything is available um, now on our website and, and on Facebook. All the lectures are uh, were also online <coughs> published. Um, uh, Sean, Sean Cleary gave a very good summary of all of this, um, how to say it, uh, novel characteristics of our time. And what we agreed upon is that um, there is a new kind of order, which is rather disorder. It's an anarchy. We are heading towards global anarchy. Meanwhile, and this is a little bit um, my, my critical a remark on your remarks, um, the old order is still present in many ways. 
you didn't mention the neoliberal uh, economic order, powerful players are still uh, in action, in charge. Um, economic players, financial players, individuals, um, banks, systems of banks, the Vertage Union, IMF, etc., etc. Hmm? And their, their supportive agencies, the mainstream media. They, the suggestion is, and many people believe so, because they don't have time to analyze, because they want, they insist that we still have a certain order, a global order. That this, they, they suggest that everything is more or less okay, business as usual can come back, and this is the best of our possible, all possible words. And so it's very, very difficult to, to challenge these powerful agencies or, 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 or players. And that we discussed it yesterday because we have our conventional frameworks, institutions, um, organizations, such as the nation state, which is completely outdated and incapable of, of tackling with these problems. Absolutely no solution would come out from just individual nation states. And this is the time where we are relapsing to that kind of belief system where people again suggest, also started by politicians, want to believe that their individual nation state is going to provide security. When nothing else remained, then you go back to your tribe. Those who speak, all, all of them, Hungarian, yeah, we, us, or German, or whatever. And that is the danger, and this, I'm sorry if I'm repeating myself, that, that we need, this is a human psyche, we need a sort of security, otherwise we can't really exist. And so, uh, that's, I think this, this is the danger that I agree, the international and global institutions are crumbling, collapsing, fading away, um, becoming, losing all of their convincing powers and credibility. I mentioned already the UN, you did too. Uh, and Donald Trump uh, could say um, that the UN is a cafe clutch. Uh, that was in, in no, without no, no reaction from the UN because it is becoming a cafe clutch place without any convincing power. So we, we, this is a very, very, very dangerous, I agree that each time in history is a time of, of conflict. You can say the same to uncertainty. Every, every time was a time of uncertainty, but we need to define the new characteristics, I think, and we, we did a very good job, thank you for all of the excellent lecturers today and the, the previous weeks. Um, and what, I, my question to Jim is, so what, what to do? Because there probably are some simple solutions, not to let us expose to these um, in networks so, so much, how to say it, so in such an 100% way. Hmm? Okay, I would like to other people to speak as well. Uh, Ferenc, uh, I share your opinion uh, concerning uh, some existing rules uh, on the economic or the entrepreneurial level, uh, but I think uh, they are also endangered uh, by what uh, was uh, exposed uh, by uh, Mr. Skelly here. Uh, I think uh, the example concerning ma mask having a great importance on transport, I think by a virus or whatever, I think it can be ruined totally. Uh, I think uh, between a very sh short time. So far, I think the real danger might be that we are moving to an anarchical situation where everybody is depending on himself. I think uh, that's one of uh, the real challenges. Uh, Everybody, uh, there's a good saying in Vienna, everybody thinking on him or herself, only me, I'm thinking on myself. Huh? Uh, this is, I think, the anarchy is the best definition possible. Huh? And I think we are a little bit moving in this direction, that the systems are not really uh, working and existing and they will depend on me. Huh? So far the request, I will take a rifle or a pistol and so to protect myself is even more coming up. So far, I think the request is really for 
some kind of political and economic order, I think, uh, to develop some forces, how we can establish rules uh, which are really defended. And who might it be? The current order is not really able to do it. And I think the discussion we have is not really showing in this direction. We are very much uh, depending old, on old system. I mean, tell you one example. Uh, I'm a little bit connected with the OEC. Yeah? And uh, doing some job in the Balkans and so on, I'm pretty well known, especially by the Americans. I think they had a very nice exercise proposing an OEC. Uh, what is happening if uh, a war or uh, an, an attempt is trying uh, to, to close uh, such important centers on electricity distribution and so on and so on? Eh? There are some f few places. Uh, the decision making in OEC was very interesting. I think the majority was in favor. The Russians were totally against, eh? saying everything is protected in Russia. We have no problem. This exercise, this training was established. Who was taking part in the best way possible with the best experts? The Russians. I think they were totally aware that what they are saying officially is not true, uh, and that might be the real danger. Here you can see, I think here we had a certain disarray uh, what to do it in this. I think the proposals going in this direction, uh, maybe we are falling back in a kind of uh, a society before society that everybody is protect protecting him or herself and that's it. I think it's a kind of new loneliness which might exist. Right, can, I, can I just uh, say a bit more? I. I one of one of the issues I think is is the way in which information is communicated and shared. Um, I, my own uh, concern, ongoing concern, <coughs> is with accidental nuclear war, and I it's not a trivial matter. We don't want to think about it, but I can tell you that it's right on the edge. Um, in 1978, I think it was, 78 or 79, um, the third ranking person in the Pentagon was somebody named uh, William Perry. William Perry became Secretary of Defense during the Clinton administration. William Perry got a telephone call in the middle of the night from the general under Cheyenne Mountain where the uh, um, possible nuclear attacks on the United States are monitored and where the president would normally be called if one was in process. Perry uh, took the call in the middle of the night, and the general said, uh, Mr. Perry, I'm calling you instead of the president, hmm, because I don't believe that the geopolitical situation show, should show our computers indicating that several hundred Soviet mis nuclear-tipped missiles are coming in on the United States. Um, and I'm calling you because you're the technical guy, and basically you Maybe it's a technical problem. It turned out it was a computer training tape that had been put into the computers. Hmm? Now, imagine if he'd called Donald Trump. Think about it. Huh? And um, the same thing happened on the... <laughs> the same thing happened on the Soviet side. And Stanislav Petrov, as some of you may know, was honored recently for taking the same kind of judgment in the face of so-called objective data, right? And, you know, we also know that the um, Cuban Missile Crisis came very, very close to a nuclear exchange. The final thing on this that I will say is that, um, you know, uh, I've told this to several people here, including you, Ferry, I think, um, about uh, Daniel Ellsberg's book, uh, Doomsday. Daniel Ellsberg, uh, as some of you may know, released the Pentagon Papers, the 7,000-page uh, document that uh, um, showed that uh, the Vietnam War effort of the United States was informed by lie after lie after lie. Hmm? He also said, <laughs> he told us a few years ago before he published the book, he said, I never, I'm glad they never asked me if I copied anything else, because I did. <laughs> We all said, well, Dan, what did you copy? 
He said, I copied the United States' nuclear war plans, the 8,000 pages of them, right? And he's, you know, he went on to tell the story, but the story is in his new book. The worst part of it is chapter four, titled Delegation, because we all are socialized to the myth that only the president or whoever else is the number one person in a country can do anything about the launching of nuclear weapons. And what Ellsberg makes clear is that in the United States, probably there are several hundred people who can launch nuclear weapons under particular circumstances. Uh, so we all will remember Dr. Strangelove. If you allow me to, to, to make a side remark, uh, I think uh, sometimes uh, in discussions you are asked uh, in which stage we are uh, by the development. Personally, I may say and regret to say so, uh, I, I'm really convinced that we are in the beginning of a third world war. Uh, I think uh, uh, what uh, Professor Craig was mentioned, that we are sleepwalkers in this direction, is not only true for the first world war, it's really true for the third world war, which for sure existing. And even there is a nice level uh, of development, uh, even made by the movie industry. Huh? I think Hollywood is very much producing this. If you are switching on all the different cha TV channels, you can see one event after the other showing this direction. We are consuming it nice uh, in the evening because we are exhausted and uh, we are really happy to look at this. Uh, it's really going on. Interesting, interesting. But I think we have not really an instrument to discuss this. I think that's an extremely dangerous question. I think no chance to forbid it. That's a nonsense. I think what is forbidden will happen. Uh, that's true by the whole uh, human history. Uh, but what to do in this direction to create a more serious discussion about uh, how we are endangered by ourselves in a certain mood that we are taking the things not serious. We are taking it like an event which is happening by TV or whatever, by a nice movie uh, or maybe a nice story or, or whatever. I think I think this is a very critical question here, and I think it might be also be a, maybe I'm very outdated, but the question of ethics. Where is the ethics of those who are doing this story, earning a lot of money on creating more feeling of danger for the human being? I think that's not really sentenced critically. I, I want to maybe uh, take a s slight sidestep here just from the way I'm thinking about this. Um, yes, we may be, and I think it's very worthwhile to raise the issue of walking into the Third World War in sleepwalking, but I also, want, and, and I certainly appreciate both of your contributions and ways of thinking about this that, that should concern us deeply in one sense. But I also want to think about it in a slightly different way, and that is that there is a tension here, in my view, between, on one hand, a, a particular threat. It comes from a technology, but we have had other threats from the technology. But part of that is the way that we think about ourselves collectively humanity in that con that context. And what I'm thinking about is there is, uh, as I see it, a tension between the sense of identity as particular populations, whatever that is, ethnic, physical location, um, style of, of working, whatever it is, co corporate even, and a very strong tendency, which in some ways the internet has accentuated, which is of libertarianism. That is, you know, don't bother me, I'm, I'm just doing my thing and I've got to be free to do that. And that applies in very many ways. And I think it actually has to do with the senses of identity. 
It may be a sad way of, of expressing it, but it is very fundamental. And it addresses identity, it addresses a sense of agency. Um, you mentioned in one, at one point about the guns and the crazy situation in the US. Well, some of that is, again, libertarianism, but some of it is quite deliberate effort on the NRA part. It was a racist, very deliberate strategy, which now has blown up, but is great for the, the, ind the arms industry. But it also underlies a sense of failure of, a, of a other mechanisms for agency. So if I've got the gun in my hand, I can do, you know, no, I, I can do whatever I want. I'm powerful. Strange view of it. Can, but the point that I, I really want to get at is how else, you said, what can be done? Well, how else can we conceive of our relationship? to each other. I worked on a 20-year sort of re-examination of the Brundtland report that we handed to the UN in May 20, 2007. And someone in that group that worked on this came up with a wonderful phrase called the kinship of interdependence. We don't have the tribes. But how do we begin to be aware of our sense of ourselves in a much more globalized sense, not in the sense of everything homogenized, but as part of this kinship of interdependence. I, I, um, I tried to address some of this in um, a book I published last year called The Sarcophagus of Identity, because it, in fact, is um, a kind of prison which people think, uh, uh, people assume the prison doesn't exist and that they are speaking to something deep. It is a product today of the nation state, and that's part of the issue. Um, I have thought that the people like um, Paul Ricoeur, um, Macron's mentor, um, were trying to do something with the concept of oneself as another, and the notion that we are all one species and, and to stop the game. But I think with the failure of religious narratives, which I think one has to consider, regardless of one's perspective on some of them, that the religious, with the decline of religious narratives and the disembedding of people from real communities as opposed to social networking communities, you have a problem of meaninglessness. And since there is no narrative that gives people a transcendent sense of, of meaning, the nation state seems to be a reasonable substitute for some people. Wave the flag. Italy first, and so on and so forth. That's the game. That's the game. I. I didn't expect to be saying in the last session of uh, this fairly remarkable seminar, meeting, discussion group, whatever it is, um, that uh, the program design had actually brought about in this final session a wholly remarkable synthesis of just about everything that has actually been discussed over the course of the past several days. But it has, and to the extent that Ferenc has already, as it were, granted this latitude, let me thank Bella profoundly for having put it together in that fashion. So let me try and draw some strands out of this extraordinary interface here, informed by lots of the rest. Why do we see this tendency toward fragmentation, anarchy, if you will, or incipient anarchy, if you choose, at this point in time, when we have, in a certain sense, passed the apogee of globalization? Well, in one sense, uh, Thomas spoke about it right at the beginning, and that is the stability of sparse networks. The higher the degree of connectivity, the higher the degree of fragility. And if you think about that in human terms, 
it is functionally impossible, you both just referred to it in the context of social networks, it's functionally impossible to have close relationships with millions of people. You can't do that. It doesn't matter how many friends you've got on Facebook, it's completely irrelevant. They're not your friends, right? You don't know them. Um, you may know 15 of them, or maybe even 30, but you certainly don't know thousands. So what does that mean at heart? Well, what it means is that norms in the sociological sense of that term are central for the existence of society. You made the point very correctly that we're seeing a fragmentation of international norms, not just use cogens and treaty law, but the normative frame that operates at the international level is under an enormous degree of strain under present circumstances. You know, we use this ridiculous phrase, ridiculous phrase, I was speaking about it in New York on, on, on Sunday, international community. What in God's name is the international community today? There is no normative coherence in an international community on any issue about anything. Right? So it's, it's, it's a silly phrase, but you need such things at whatever scale you're going to operate. Norms are really about setting expectations for interpersonal behavior. Right? The norm here is I will not fling this microphone at somebody I disagree with. If I violate that norm, then by definition you will be thrown into chaos. Anything that's being broadcast will look pretty awful. And somebody presumably will wrestle me to the floor. Right? So we are fracturing the norms of an order which we imagined we could scale largely through economic and financial means and long value chains in respect of manufacturing. And we've engaged in hubris and we've gone beyond that particular point. Now, how that relates to what Jim has been talking about actually matters enormously. Because the weaknesses in this digital connectivity that enables financial flows, enables long value chains, enables social communication, enables the distributed corporation, the weaknesses in that system, long before we get to the Internet of Things, and the vulnerability of these systems once you're in the IoT space are magnified by at least two orders of magnitude. The vulnerabilities in those systems create extraordinary threats to the stability of the system on which our lives exist. You are live streaming this conference. Well, cutting that live stream is the easiest thing under the sun. I could do it from my chair, right? But that doesn't matter very much. What about, we've referenced them all, what about cutting energy supply networks? What about cutting patient data distribution between triage centers and, and, and emergency rooms? What about cutting, uh, you can think of anything you like, it doesn't really matter, before you get into the catastrophic scenarios associated with nuclear war. Now, let me tell you something. You made the interesting point about getting off Gmail. What I'm about to say now has got nothing to do with anyone. But one of the ways in which cyber attacks are magnified is by creating networks of proxy units which are not under the control of a state. And that's done, and it's happening routinely at present. That is done by implanting communication viruses, they're not worms, communication viruses onto computers. Anyone who has visited, I'm not suggesting any of you have, but anyone who has visited a pornographic site, anyone who has visited a shopping site, anyone who has visited half a dozen different known entertainment sites in the course of the last six months, the odds that your machine is operating as a proxy for the purpose of the multiplication of future attacks is probably 95%, right? And it's occurring continuously, and it's not infecting your system. Oh, well, it has infected your system, but it's not taking your system down. They don't want to take your system down. They want to own your system for the purpose of a future attack. 
And that future attack might be a phishing attack, it might be an exercise in information gathering, it might be a denial of service, it might be whatever. It might be directed against a state target, a military target, a commercial target. It might be for the theft of intellectual property, or it might be for denial of service in some or other fashion. And all connected instruments are being utilized for similar opportunities today. The Ukraine attack was done precisely through that type of operation, as I'm sure you know. It wasn't just what they had and could utilize out of the particular site they used. It was a network probably close on a thousand times that scale as a result of connectivity. That's the world we live in today. Now, under those circumstances, is trust eroded? Of course, trust is eroded. Are norms viable? Of course, norms are not viable under these particular circumstances. Are we in a process where the entire institutional structure of what we rely on for the ordinary functioning of society is in the process of redefinition? Yeah, get used to it. It's a fact. Don't feel depressed about it, by the way. <laughs> it's just, it's something we've got to deal with today. So in the context of what has to be done about this, we've actually got to start developing alternative mechanisms for the restoration of understanding, and I don't mean that in a grand philosophical sense. I need to know what you're likely to do if I do X. That's what we need in order to be able to interact with some degree of safety and security. So we need to consciously work at the re-establishment of those understandings. That's what the Paris call on trust and security and internet communication is starting to try and do. It's so far from being at a point at which it will produce results, it's almost embarrassing, but that's the intent behind it. We need those sorts of initiatives. We need to strip away the pretense that the existing structures and systems are fit for purpose, are adequate, are serving broad functions. And they are until they break. But we're at a point where the level of erosion of the functionality of these things exposes all of us to fairly extraordinary risk. And it's a good idea to be aware of it. Then we can start figuring out what we do next. Rebuilding after crisis is easy. The challenge is defining what a future order might look like ahead of a crisis actually materializing. In cyber, just to take that as an illustration, the biggest problem is we have no doctrinal limits, we have no rules of engagement, and we have no rules of escalation. At what point in time does a cyber attack in the context of an ongoing hybrid war, you're living with the challenge in the OSCE at the moment, at what point in time does that justify a shift to kinetic? It's not clear. There's no rules. There's no, there's no definitive elements in respect of this. But unless we start thinking through all of this, getting our heads around what the rules ought to be, and developing reciprocal expectations in these spaces, we're very badly exposed. Can I, can I just quickly... Uh, uh, Sean, your, your comments are on the mark as far as I'm concerned. One of the things that's being talked about but doesn't have enough support, and we should be supporting it, is a digital Geneva Convention, right? The laws of war, but in this case, digital stuff. Second thing is that in terms of norms, Joseph Nye has a very interesting piece about this on the Harvard Belfort Center about the need for norms in cyberspace. 